Sunday here because Sunday is the first day of the week. And it is the day of the week on which uh, Jesus rose from the dead. And so every week we really commemorate the event that we specially commemorate on this day of the year that we call Easter Sunday or Resurrection Sunday. We celebrate the fact, the historic fact, that Jesus is raised from the dead. And because he is, we can believe the promises he gives us in connection with his death and resurrection, live our lives full of purpose and joy and peace. Today, uh, I'd like you to be aware of the announcements, the events coming up. First of all, this week we resume our regular events of confirmation and youth on Wednesday, and then next week, uh, worship and Sunday school, Sunday school and worship, I should say, are the regular times. I won't be here next week, uh, we're going to be in San Diego, California. I think that's somewhere over over there somewhere. And uh, we have uh, Pastor Chris Hartley from the Lutheran Brethren Fellowship Church preaching. And uh, I want you all to be here again as he brings the Word of God. So I plan on being here next week at, at 11 o'clock for worship. Remind the women that WMF Rally is on Saturday the 29th of this month of April. It's at Zion in Tioga. Jonathan and Tamba Abel, uh, Bra uh, Brazilian missionaries, are going to be speakers. And then uh, the Christian Ed Committee is inviting all the friends and members of Emmanuel, not just the kids, but adults as well, to a time of fellowship at the Ark. Also, that's the, uh, I want to say, Association <coughs> Retreat Center. Where you are. In this case, it's the Area Recreation Center, I think, Williston Area Recreation Center. It's uh, way over on the east side of town on 18th. Uh, we're going to have an event from 4 or 1 o'clock to 4 o'clock, uh, just a time of fellowship and, and recreation together, time to grow closer to one another. Then I want to let you know that evening at 6 o'clock, we're going to have a late supper and then uh, a documentary on Martin Luther as we celebrate the 500th anniversary of his nailing the 95 Theses to the door at the Wittenberg Chapel. So we invite you all to come to that and uh, look forward to learning more about our heritage. Then we're going to have a work day here at Emmanuel. And don't close your ears now. A lot of work to do when we do it together. It's a great time of growing closer to one another. And we might even get a little exercise. But on May 6th, that's a Saturday, we'll start work at 9.30 in the morning. We look forward to seeing you here. want to let you know that the beautiful flowers in the center of our altar today are in memory of Joel and Diane and Eileen Iverson. We thank you, Vernon, for sharing those with us today. It's wonderful to have flowers on Easter Sunday. It reminds us that the grave is not the end. That for us who are trusting in Jesus the Savior, that the grave leads to life. We commemorate that every year for those who are here. You know how, but if you're visiting today, we have before us an old rugged cross. A lot of people wear a cross as jewelry and think it's just a pretty decoration. It's not a pretty decoration. It was an instrument by which the Romans put the worst criminals to death. And our God became a man in order to die on one of those. He was nailed to one of those outside of Jerusalem. And he shed his blood on that cross and he died in your place and in my place and was laid in the tomb. And on the third day, showed that by his death, sin and death are defeated enemies. That the grave is no longer for believers the end. But rather it's the way simply to transition from the life we have in this world to eternal life with God in heaven. And so today, at the end of our service, toward the end of our service, I should say, we'll be flowering the cross, symbolizing the fact that Jesus took an instrument that was meant to for death and turned it into the instrument through which we receive life. We receive life through Jesus' death on the cross. So uh, you will see that cross transformed, and, and it is a transformed instrument then, an instrument of death that's turned into the source of life for all who believe. So we look forward to that today. If you didn't know you were supposed to bring flowers today, if you didn't bring any, there's a lot of them right in the front pews. So come on up. Grab one of your favorite color flowers, 
Some of the stems are really long, you might want to break them off as you come because there might be a long stem in there. can be difficult and, and then uh, we'll gather around the cross while we listen to beautiful Easter music and, and uh, see it transform before our eyes. I think that's all the announcements. Is there anything I'm forgetting this time? We will read together in our call for worship. Since then you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. For you died, and your life was hidden with Christ in God. And as your life appears, then you also will appear with Him in glory. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for the hope that you give us through the event of the empty tomb, the event of Jesus' resurrection from the dead. Thank you for inspiring your apostles to record what they saw, so that today we might know what happened 2,000 years ago. And in that event, find reason and purpose and value. Grant this, we pray now, as we hear your word proclaimed today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're going to begin with hymn number 111, our, our uh, traditional song of the Good Easter. We're going to sing the first two verses very quietly, but sing the chorus very loudly, and then the third verse and chorus very loud. 111. Pursued by a pharaoh, and it seemed that they were all dead. 
And if it were left to their devices, they would all have been dead. But we see God setting them free. In Exodus chapter 14, it's a long passage, beginning at verse 10 uh, through verse 15, 1, or chapter 15, 1. As Pharaoh approached, the Israelites looked up, and there were the Egyptians marching after them. They were terrified and cried out to the Lord. They said to Moses, was it because there were no graves in Egypt that you brought us to the desert to die? What have you done to us by bringing us out of Egypt? Did we say to you in Egypt, leave us alone? Let us serve the Egyptians. It would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the desert. <coughs> Moses answered the people, do not be afraid. Stand firm. You will see the deliverance the Lord will bring you today. The Egyptians you see today, you will never see again. The Lord will fight for you. You need only to stand still. Then the Lord said to Moses, Why are you crying out to me? Tell the Israelites to move on. Raise your staff and stretch out your hand over the sea and divide the water so the Israelites can go through the sea on dry ground. I will harden the hearts of the Egyptians so that they will go in after them. And I will gain glory through Pharaoh and his army, through his chariots and his horsemen. The Egyptians will know that I am the Lord when I gain glory through Pharaoh, his chariots and his horsemen. Then the angel of God who had been traveling in front of Israel's army withdrew and went behind them. The pillar of cloud also moved from in front and stood behind them, coming between the armies of Egypt and Israel. Throughout the night, the cloud brought darkness to the one side and to the other, and light to the other side, so neither went near the other all night long. Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and all that night the Lord drove back the sea with a strong east wind and turned it into dry land. The waters were divided, and the Israelites went through the sea on dry ground with a wall of water on their right and on their left. The Egyptians pursued them, and all Pharaoh's horses and chariots and horsemen followed them into the sea. During the last watch of the night, the Lord looked down from the pillar of fire and cloud at the Egyptian army and threw it into confusion. He made the wheels of their chariots come off so that they had difficulty driving. And the Egyptians said, let's get away from the Israelites. The Lord is fighting for them against Egypt. Then the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand over the sea so that the waters may flow back over the Egyptians and their chariots and horsemen. Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and at daybreak the sea went back to its place. The Egyptians were fleeing toward it, and the Lord swept them into the sea. The water flowed back and covered the chariots and horsemen, the entire army of Pharaoh that had followed the Israelites into the sea. Not one of them survived. But the Israelites went through the sea on dry ground, a wall of water on their right and on their left. That day, the Lord saved Israel from the hands of the Egyptians, and Israel saw the Egyptians lying dead on the shore. And when the Israelites saw the great power the Lord displayed against the Egyptians, the people feared the Lord and put their trust in him and in Moses, his servant. And Moses and the Israelites sang this song to the Lord. I will sing to the Lord, for he has highly exalted the horse and its rider. He has hurled into the sea. The Apostle Paul tells us of a great victory not one over Pharaoh's army, but one over death itself. In his first letter to the church at Corinth, chapter 15, the entire chapter is wonderful to read, and I would encourage you on this Easter Sunday to read that entire chapter. But today, this morning, we'll read the first 11 verses where he declares to us the victory. Now, brothers, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel you are saved, if you hold firmly to the word I preached to you. Otherwise, 
you have believed in vain. For what I received, I pass on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Peter and then to the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all, he appeared to me also as to one abnormally born. For I am the least of the apostles, and do not even deserve to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God I am what I am, and his grace to me was not without effect. No, I worked harder than all of them, yet not I, but the grace of God that was in me. Whether then it was I or they, this is what we preach, and this is what you believe. We continue singing together how deep the Father's love for us, you find the words in the insert in your bulletin. And 
we're going to focus on all three of these people, especially on Mary, because she has an encounter with the risen Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Uh, John, again, as eyewitness records this, I, I, I want to emphasize that because what we're reading today isn't some kind of a tale that's supposed to have a spiritual lesson. It isn't like Aesop's fables. We're not reading about a fable today. We're reading an event that took place in history, that took place 2,000 years ago. I'm really glad today Brian is going to be singing a song, Was It a Morning Like This? And as I was driving to Beaver Creek, I was thinking about that song because uh, the event we're going to read about begins in the dark. I was driving to Beaver Creek, it was dark out. And uh, as I was driving, I saw the sun coming up in the east. Yeah, in the east. And uh, beautiful, I don't know if it was a planet or star out there just above where the sun was coming. It's just a beautiful morning driving out there. And when I thought about that, I thought, you know, what we're reading about in this text is like a morning, if you, if you ever get up early enough that it's dark when you get up and you watch the sun come up, that's what we're reading about. It was an actual day in history. History is a scary word sometimes. We think, oh yeah, I remember history classes. Sometimes people say, I'm making history, or we're making history today. We don't usually say I am, but we are often. You know what? Every day you're making history. You just might not be making history that people record. Everything that's happened in the past is history. And the only way we know about what happened in the past is either we were there and experienced it, or somebody told us about it. There's a lot of things that have happened over the last several weeks that are now history, but we know they happened because we got testimony about what happened. And what we receive today is just that. And you know what? If it's true the next day, the testimony you receive about what happened the day before, like we heard about the mother of all bombs being dropped a short time ago, how many believe it fell and hit the ground and exploded in Afghanistan? Only a few of you? <laughs> Some people don't believe the towers got knocked down in 2001 either, but they did. Yeah, or that uh, was a conspiracy. No, I don't think so. But when history happens, it gets recorded. We read about it. We weren't eyewitnesses. We believe it because we receive testimony from reliable witnesses. That's the only way we know what happened. If, it, if we weren't there, it was by eyewitness testimony. And so we know about the past, we know about most of what's happened in the past, especially the, the events that seem significant to this world and are recorded and tend to be passed out from generation to generation. What happened this past week, we read about that bomb being dropped, and we all believe it. But if you don't read about it until next week, it's still true, even though a whole week has gone by. And if you read about it next year, it's still true, even though a whole year has gone by. And if you wait a thousand years and you're an archaeologist and you dig up a newspaper, and well, our newspapers won't last that long. But anyway, you get the idea. If you dig it up and you read the account, you believe it happened. It doesn't matter that a lot of time has gone by. An eyewitness of what happened wrote about it. And there's testimony as to what happened, and so we find out what happened in history. When the song is sung, was it a morning like this? We need to remember that mornings happen day after day after day after day, whether we're there to observe them or not. Usually we have some kind of evidence that a new day has begun because it's later than it was when we went to bed. So this is a morning that happened in time, and it was recorded about 2,000 years ago, John was the last one that God inspired to record uh, these events. But he was an eyewitness of what happened in a real morning. A morning that followed, a morning that followed a day that John would never forget. He records the event too of Jesus being nailed to the cross and of dying and of the fear that the disciples had as, as they scattered, and of Peter and how he denied Jesus to prevent being perhaps nailed to a cross himself at that time. They couldn't understand what was happening. And even though Jesus had told them that he would die in Jerusalem or just outside Jerusalem, even though he told them of the events that would take place, about his arrest and his being beaten and mocked and crucified, and even though he had said on the third day he would rise from the dead, they did not get it. It was not in their idea 
of what a Messiah would be. So they didn't go to the grave. Jesus was not buried like most crucified individuals. Most were thrown in a mass pit. Crucifixion was the execution that was done for the worst of criminals. It was done to set an example for everybody else. You better not murder, you better not steal, or you're going to end up like this. They were thrown in mass pits, typically, and buried together. Jesus was not. Joseph of Arimathea, who had hewn a, term, a tomb out of rock, was a, a man of means, a man of wealth got permission to take the body of Jesus and lay it in a rock tomb. We don't use those very much in our culture anymore. God knew what he was doing and made sure that Jesus was laid in a tomb like this. We'll find out why. John chapter 20, verses 1 through 18. Early on the first day of the week, they waited until the Sabbath was over. Friday, Jesus died on the cross. Sabbath was Saturday. No work on Sabbath. Sunday comes and they want to make sure they get there as early as possible. Early, while well, it was still dark on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed, I like that word, from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, that would be John, and said, They've taken away the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they have put him. So Peter and the other disciples started before the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple, John likes to brag, outran Peter. And he reached the tomb first. Bad translation, he bent over and looked. He looked into the tomb. He looked at the strips of linen lying there, but John didn't go in. Then Simon Peter, who was behind him, arrived and went straight into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the burial cloth that had been around Jesus' head. The cloth was folded up by itself, separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple, this would be John, who had reached the tomb first, also went inside. John saw and believed. They still did not, did not understand from Scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to their homes, but Mary stood outside the tomb crying, and as she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. They asked her, Woman, why are you crying? They've taken my Lord away, she said, but I don't know where they have put him. At this she turned around and saw Jesus there, but she did not realize that it was Jesus. Woman, he said, why are you crying? Who is it you are looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she said, sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him, and I will get him. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned toward him and cried out in Aramaic, Ramoni, which means teacher. Jesus said, Do not hold on to me, for I have not yet returned to the Father. Go and step to my brothers and tell them, I am returning to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news, I have seen the Lord. And she told them, she told what he had said to her. Heavenly Father, I pray that you would bless these words to us, this account. And we might see our faith does not rest on some emotional experience or some kind of spiritual experience, Lord, that it rests on the fact that while death has held so many and never let them go, it could not hold Jesus. And that because it could not hold Jesus, it will not hold any who believe in him. Fill us with hope and joy, we pray today in Jesus' name. Amen. So it's a surprise. Uh, Mary was going to anoint the body of Jesus. It had been wrapped, as was typical, with spices and linen several times around and, and left in the tomb. It was done quickly. Uh, Joseph of Arimathea and those who helped him uh, put him in the tomb quickly because the Sabbath was coming. Sundown would be Sabbath. They weren't allowed to work on Sabbath, so the anointing of Jesus' body was not complete 
And, and I'm sure Mary and the other women who went to the tomb, John only mentions Mary, but the other gospel writers mention the fact that she didn't go by herself. Mary with the other women, no doubt, were worried, hoping that they could get to the body in time before too much of a stench was present, that they could anoint his body and finish the burial process and show their love, show the love that they had for Jesus. And, and it's obvious they were expecting then as they went to the tomb that they'd find his body there. And, and we're told that, that Mary Magdalene, when she got there, saw the stone had been removed from the entrance. That's kind of a mild word in the English. See, it was a big round stone, really heavy. The women, as they had gone to the tomb, were wondering how they'd get it out of the way so they could anoint Jesus' body. They didn't need to worry about it when they arrived. It not only was rolled away from the entrance of the tomb, had it been rolled away, it would have had to gone uphill. The tombs were designed so that it could be rolled downhill by a few strong men into place, and there it would not be moved again. In this case, when they got there, it wasn't just rolled up away from the entrance of the tomb. It was cast aside from the tomb, a big stone. I don't know if you guys have done any rock hauling. Some of you are farmers. And it's amazing how even a fairly small looking stone can be quite a challenge to pick up and get on the trailer to get hauled off the field. This was a huge stone and would have taken many men, but it wasn't there in front of the tomb. It didn't hold Jesus in. Jesus could go through stone by this time, the body was gone. But it was rolled aside for another reason, and we read about that reason today. They find the stone is rolled away and there's no body inside. And they're shocked. They wonder, did the Pharisees and the Sanhedrin hate Jesus so much that even being buried in a rich man's tomb was too much for them? They nailed him to a cross. They'd given him a criminal's death. Now he was buried in a rich man's tomb. Did they want to take his body out and throw it in the pit with all of the other bodies of all the other criminals that had died on crosses? No doubt they were filled with fear. And while the other women lingered, Mary, who must have been younger than the rest, goes back. I don't know how far they traveled, but she went back on foot then to tell Peter and John what they'd found. And she's all excited and she's all upset. They've taken the Lord out of the tomb. We don't know where they put him. So Peter and John start walking back to the tomb. Our text doesn't tell us this, but at some point they start running, probably because they met the rest of the women who had seen the angels, who had spoken to Jesus, going back, and now they start running. Like I say, John likes to brag. He outran Peter. Peter's probably older than John. They start running to the tomb after they hear this news. There's more than just an empty tomb to see here. And as they run to the tomb, John arrives first. Says they lean down. That wouldn't have been the case. The opening of the tomb would have been high enough that they could have stood and looked in. That's important to understand because they could actually, in looking into the tomb, see the place where the body had been laid. Had they had to lean down, the body would have been laid above the entrance of the tomb, but they uh, they look. John looks in, and just looking in in the early morning, he could see the linens, and it was strange because they they weren't cut apart. Uh, they weren't like they'd been taken off and thrown in a heap somewhere. They were laying there as though the body had just gone right through the linens, and they had just collapse without a body to hold them up anymore. That's how they saw them. That's how they were, except for one piece of linen. The one that had been around Jesus' face had been folded up neatly and set in a separate place. Jesus had made sure that the stone had been removed so that they could look in. Jesus had made sure that things were left in such a way that testimony would be born to the fact that he was no longer dead, that his body had not been stolen. If his body had been stolen, they probably wouldn't have bothered to unwrap it until they got it away from the tomb. And even if they had unwrapped it, it wouldn't be laying the way it was. 
John saw, and then impetuous Peter comes along. He doesn't stop by the entrance of the tomb. He runs right in, and he sees what we've described, what John describes in this text. Finally, John goes in, and he says something remarkable, something beautiful. It says, finally, the other disciple who had reached the tomb first also went inside. He saw and believed. What did he believe? On seeing the linens lying flat and on hearing the testimony of the women, he believed that Jesus was risen from the dead. That's what he believed. That Jesus was alive. He doesn't say much yet at this point. John was choir of the two apostles that arrived, Peter and John. He doesn't say much. But he testifies to the fact that what he'd seen and what it did inside of him had made him a believer that death had been defeated by Jesus and that Jesus was alive. So the disciples go back to their homes. Apparently Mary Magdalene wandered back to the tomb again. And we find her there and there we see something remarkable again. As she beholds what is uh, the case inside the tomb, angels appear to her. They ask her, why are you crying? The word for crying here in the Greek means she was sobbing uncontrollably. I've been with people and I've been in that condition with uncontrollable weeping. You know, when a loved one dies and it's been verified and we've put them in the tomb, we don't expect to see them alive again, even if they've told us they're going to rise from the dead. It's just beyond our experience, and yet what takes place in this case, as Mary turns around, as she beholds one now, she probably got to talk to the other women too, because she's no longer concerned maybe that the, uh, that the Pharisees and the Sanhedrin had dragged Jesus' body off now. She thinks this is the gardener. Joseph of Arimathea must have gotten some men to take the body of Jesus and put it someplace else, maybe out of fear of, of what the Sanhedrin would do. And so thinking it's the gardener who asked this beautiful question first, woman, number one, why are you crying? Number two, who is it you are looking for? Notice not, what are you looking for? Who is it you are looking for? She says, sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you've put him, and I will get him. Okay. Guys, we all acknowledge women don't always make sense in what they say, do they? She was going to get him? Not likely, but in her grief, this was her thought, and her desire out of love was to anoint the body of Jesus still. And then this person she thinks is a gardener says her name. And it reminds me of what Jesus had said earlier to the disciples. He said, I'm a good shepherd. I call my sheep by name, and they know me, and I know them. When he says her name, Mary, she recognizes him for who he is. She turns and she has one word, Raboni, not just teacher, but my wonderful teacher. She speaks in Aramaic. And we know what she did because of Jesus' response. She grabs hold of him like she's never going to let him go. And Jesus says, oh, Mary, don't hold on to me. I've not yet returned to the Father. It isn't that he was going to immediately go to the Father, but he was going to remain for 40 days before he went to be with the Father. He was going to meet with the apostles and as Paul testifies to more than 500 people at one time. You know, ancient manuscripts of 1 Corinthians have been found so old that even liberal scholars agree that the belief in the resurrection of Christ existed immediately in Jesus' day. It didn't take years and years and years for somebody to come up with the story of Jesus' resurrection. And, and Paul testifies then that many, over 500, who had witnessed Jesus raised from the dead most were still alive. So you can check out the eyewitness testimony from many, many, many different people. And he says, I'm one of the witnesses as well, as though strangely born because Jesus ascended into heaven before I got to see him alive. 
Don't hold on to me in 40 days. I'm going to the Father or I'll spend time with you. So you don't need to hang on to me. I'll be with you for 40 days, but I need to go to the Father. But I have a mission for you, Mary. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, Wow, my brothers, read the Gospels. You'll never see Jesus call the disciples his brothers until this time. There's one time where he says, I call you my friends. But now, after his resurrection, after their victory had been won through the cross and the resurrection of Jesus, he who is the Son of God has completed the process necessary to adopt believers as his brothers, co-heirs with Christ, were called in the epistles. Go to my brothers, Mary. Tell them, I'm returning to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Please notice again the words, not to our Father and our God. To my Father and my God. Jesus is uniquely the Son of God. He's the eternal Son of God, as we've confessed. I believe that Jesus Christ, true God, begotten of the Father from eternity. My Father and my God, but because of his shedding his blood on the cross for you and for me and for the world. Because in doing so, death and sin are defeated enemies. There is forgiveness through his shed blood. God remains just and the justifier of those who have faith in Christ. And as the one risen from the dead to show that when he said it is finished on the cross, it truly is finished, that death is no longer the end. For all who believe, death is only a transition now from life in this world to life in the presence of God for all eternity. Going to my Father, and now because of what I've done, I can say He's your Father. My God, and now because of what I've done, I can say to you, He's your Father. Go, Mary, bring this message to the disciples. Go to my brothers and tell them that I'm returning to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. So we see Mary running back to the disciples, bearing testimony as to what she saw. I've seen the Lord. And this is what he said. So today, can't make it fancy, we can't embellish it by some marvelous speech. I'm not a marvelous speech giver. I'm only reading to you and doing the best I can to explain to you what the people we've read about today saw that day. Jesus, who died on the cross, is risen from the dead. And what he says concerning that is because of it, He's the first fruits of those who rise from the dead. Because of it, we have hope as well. Not only for our sins to be forgiven, not only to be in the presence of the Lord upon death, as Paul testifies, for us to be apart from the body is to be present with the Lord. But he is the first fruits, letting us know that as he is risen from the dead, a day is coming when he'll return to this earth to judge the world. And when he returns, our bodies that have been laying in graves will be raised from the dead. Like his immortal body will be transformed. We'll live with him forever. Why should we believe that this is going to happen in our future if we're trusting in Christ? The answer to that is simply this. That it's already happened in the past. Was it a morning like this? Yep. But on that morning, some unexpected things happened, some things that turned the world upside down. If they hadn't happened, I'll tell you this. As Paul testifies, our lives are a joke at best. But because he lives, no matter what we have to face, we can face tomorrow without fear with certain hope. 
with things around us that used to be our greatest treasure no longer being our greatest treasure. A life that's full of nothing but Jesus. Who is the way? The truth. And the life, the way by which we come to the Father. Amen. We have a quartet that has a song for us at this time. We'll move the cross. Yeah. 
concerning the crimson coloring of our sin, God's word says to all those who have brought their sins to Jesus, come let us reason together. Will your sins be a scarlet? Because of Jesus' shed blood, you will be white as snow. Amen. We'll call on the ushers at this time to receive our offering.
In the Old Testament, in Genesis, Joseph, after being sold into slavery to his brother, said he meant it for evil. God meant it for good. The cross tells us what men mean for evil. God took the cross, put his son on it, and through it accomplished salvation for us all. So it's a beautiful symbol of life today. We can know that God transforms every part of our lives and that God takes everything that happens to us and causes it to work for the good of those who love him, of those who are called according to his purpose. Let's pray together in the prayer of Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory. Oh, the depth of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable his judgments.
Hunter.